I had a good idea that this was dinosaur bone, but how significant, I had no idea. Everybody loves dinosaurs. And it was the whole notion that what I picked up on the ground was a bone from a dinosaur that lived 70 million years ago. I mean, there were femurs there that were almost a meter long. It was rock and it was heavy. For that kind of thing to be found in the Grand Prairie area, we recognized almost immediately that this Pipestone Creek bone bed was special. We run a uh, paleontologist for a day program out of the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum where people can actually uh, get the experience of what it's like to dig at a fossil site. Pipestone Creek is a small tributary of the Wapiti River in the Grand Prairie area of northern Alberta and it is the site of one of the best dinosaur graveyards anywhere in the world. Uh, welcome to the Pipestone Creek Bone Bed. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the history of the site. Back in the early 70s, uh, a guy named Al Acousta, who at the time was a science teacher in Grand Prairie, uh, was walking along the creek and he was looking for bone fragments and um, he continued along the creek finding fragments and about over there is where he kind of stopped. When I was a little kid, I became interested in collecting rocks, and so when I chose to become a teacher, I gathered that my students were somewhat the same. So when I did teach grade 8 science, I used to take them on field trips to Pipestone Creek because there was an awful lot of rock there, including some fossils as well. I used to go to Pipestone Creek to uh, look for more areas where the students could find things. And it wasn't long before I saw a rib fragment. And I thought, you know, th this has to be a dinosaur bone. And I kept finding a few more fragments. And so he kind of realized, well, they have to be coming from somewhere, right? So along that edge there, he sort of climbed up the eroded surface. Maybe 30 meters up, I could see what look like bone fragments. So I clambered up and sure enough, the vertebra, part of a femur and a few others. And as I excavated, more and more started to appear. Generally in southern Alberta, all our bone beds, the bones are spread out into one layer. Um, so at most, you'll get bones through a layer like this and they'll be well spread out. I mean, uh, one section of the bone bed was almost a meter thick with up to 300 bones per cubic meter. Uh, it was a crazy sight. I would take a screwdriver and try to jam it down, and every time I did that, it struck bone. With the bone bed, it's more practical to only have a small amount exposed at once, and that's just because of the density of the bones. They estimate that the site is at least the size of a football field, so there's still like decades more work to be done. I would pack these bones home in a backpack, often about 150 pounds worth, which didn't do much for my back <laughs> after a while. I had a large sink that I would wash them in and let them dry, and then I would try to glue some of them back together again. Just like a jigsaw puzzle, you go, oh yeah, this fits. I kept all of them on the floor in my basement, and it was covered. After the first year, I needed to get a, a permit. So I, I applied to the provincial government for a permit and they informed me that uh, no one had applied for one before, ever. So I was the first one. But after that permit expired, I was informed that I couldn't re receive another permit. And I said, well, why not? Well, you're not with any uh, recognized university, college, museum, and so on, so basically uh, you don't have a right to be excavating. 
So that really ticked me off, <laughs> but uh, that's the way it was. So I had to pack up the whole thing. And so I said, well, I will give it to the local Grand Prairie Museum. <laughs> it was beyond them as to how much bone there was. So they had quite a chore getting it out of my basement. Al kept his interest, and our interest, in fact, on the Pipestone Creek bone bed over the years. But from 79 until 85, I had a backup of dinosaurs that uh, was many years deep, and we were preoccupied with the construction of the Tyrrell Museum. Once the Tyrrell Museum was open, though, we went up to take a look in more detail at the material that Al had found and realized that this really was an incredibly important site. I kept track of everything that I excavated and exactly where it was, basically a field book. And I diagrammed everything, measured where it came from and whatnot. He did a very good job at assembling different parts of the bone. In particular, he did one section, which is what the turning point was for us in terms of wanting to work on the site. He assembled one of the nasal bosses, and as soon as we saw that nasal boss, then for the first time we knew that the bone bed was in fact Pachyrhinosaurus, and that it was probably a new species of Pachyrhinosaurus as well. Pachyrhinosaurus means thick-nosed lizard. And basically that's spread across the face and become this mass of bone. These bosses of bone have a lot to do probably with the recognition of each other and what stage in life they were at. Ceratopsian dinosaurs were very social and we know that many of them, including Pachyrhinosaurus, traveled in packs or herds and these herds may have included tens of thousands of animals. The question is, how can you have so many animals dying in the same place at the same time? It's one of the reasons as paleontologists we go back to the same site year after year looking for new evidence. It's possible that uh, this represents a flooding event where many individuals of Pachyrhinosaurus were caught in a flood and essentially drowned all at once. There are many, many examples of wildebeest doing the same kind of thing in Africa. Uh, when their herds are moving across rivers, the rivers are in flood, there's crocodiles there, um, anything to panic them and suddenly everything goes awry and many individuals end up dying. That is the nicest one I've seen. Oh, there's just kind of dropped. The summer of 86, Darren Tankey came here at the expense and support of the Tyrrell Museum and started excavating the bone bed for real. The Grand Prairie Regional College supports us being involved in community activities, educational activities, post-secondary education, and of course paleontology is post-secondary. And I was doing what I have done since then, support. I provide facilities, I provide equipment, I, I get what I can get from the community, I get money where I can get to help paleontology, and that, that's what I've done for the last 25 odd years. So Darren and his crew were there for 10 weeks, and I hung out with them for the whole 10 weeks helping with their bone preparation, taking out literally thousands, thousands of bones. I mean, it was 24-7, and, and it was fun, it was, it was enjoyable. After the first year that Turtle people had excavated the bone bed, it was time to ship all of the stuff back to Turtle Museum. Darren told him that he needed probably two large vehicles to come gather the bone, and he laughed and he said, who? You gotta be joking. So it wasn't long before he had the museum people bring all staff to see how much was gathered there in one year and everybody was just, the jaws were dropping. Now Darren knew there was a lot more things to find. We still had some issues with what the skull looked like and it wasn't an, until 89 that we actually finally found a complete skull. 
Well, getting a whole skeleton out of the bone bed was very difficult. And what we had to do was basically collect a massive amount of materials and then produce a composite skeleton. And the question, I guess, to some degree is, and, and how can we keep this under wraps? How can we not just want to tell the world and, and bring in people and say, guess what? We actually know what this dinosaur looked like. We needed to keep the bone bed quiet simply because it was in a place where no one can keep an eye on it. So to try and keep some of this under wraps, we kind of created the dummy site. So as we walked to the bone bed, there was another site. At the end of the summer, we left all of our boards and, and tools and stuff at that other site. So people would go see the stuff we left and dig there, but there was nothing there. Once we knew that 99% of the bone bed was Pachyrhinosaurus and that it was possibly a new species. Oh, if that's the case, then we should be keeping this in this part of the province, shouldn't be going down to Edmonton or Drum Mill or whatever. And so we started talking about a museum. We wanted to exhibit our own artifacts here in the north to expand our tourism base and also to uh, offer a place for our younger people to get an education on what was here. This is what's underneath us. We felt it very important that there's somebody to give us not only provincial but international scope. Mr. Curry's name kept popping up all over, you know, uh, and that was the name of choice by the board members. And so the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, named after me, uh, much to my surprise, was something I really believed in. Grand Prairie needed to have a museum of its own where they could base their operations out for looking for fossil resources and a place where the material could be prepared and stored and displayed. And now that it's built, next week, we're going to probably have 10, 15 paleontologists. Last year, we probably pushed 20, 25 from around the world. One of the great things about paleontology is that it's often amateurs who make the really significant finds. And sites develop gradually over time with the involvement of amateurs and professionals. So it's a science in which the public can really make a difference. My master's thesis is all based around um, the dinosaurs we're finding at Pipestone. I'm looking at the different growth stages um, of Pachyrhinosaurus. That's what justifies continuing excavation at the site to produce a larger sample that's going to be useful for answering some of these biological questions. I really felt that Al needed to be honored for this because of his dedication, because of the fact that um, he found something, he believed in it, uh, he pursued it long enough for us to believe in it. We ended up with uh, a tremendous amount of understanding about not just one dinosaur, but a whole group of dinosaurs. We have one of the richest bone beds in the world, and now we have a new museum built there. This all goes back to Al. So we had a special event up in Grand Prairie. Phil Curry called me up on the stage and says, this special evening we're here for the official naming of the dinosaur. Okay, that's cool. And so he says it's named Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, <laughs> named after Al, and he said, when I looked at you, your mouth was almost <laughs> by your knees. I felt so wonderful that finally, you know what I mean, someone here who had spearheaded the thing got some recognition. Up to that point, he did not know it was going to be called Lacustae. There was no question that he was very honored and very touched. And I'm sure he had a tear in the corner of his eye, too. <laughs> I have a, a sense of pride, yes, but it's a quiet sense of pride. I'm very pleased. I was part of it. You know, there were many people involved. I go in there and I, I see what's there, and I'm thinking, you know, being associated with a museum like this, that's basically renowned right now is really quite remarkable. Pachyrhinosaurus lacusta. Alacusta will now be immortal. His name will last forever. 
at least in the world of paleontology, his name will last forever. Ready? And in and smile. Alacusta wandered down a pipestone creek where he had found some fossils of some plants before. It was 1974. If you'd never been, I'd say it's worth the trip, it's worth the stay. There's ancient stones in the stream bed and black spruce trees above your head. Have you met our old friend now? He's our prehistoric pal. He's interesting, not a bore, cause he found some dinosaurs.